Can people really change? You wonder about that? You know the old cliche. Use it a lot. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Let's just break that. One of you guys bring in like a 12-year-old dog and we'll teach her new tricks. But our, I got another cliche this morning from our members who are helping me write the sermons. You can't change a leper's spots. Huh? You heard that one? But can people really change? That's the question. You want to do it on a diet level. I ask the question, it's a billion dollar industry. Does anyone ever really lose weight? One of our members said, um, I lose weight for a short time and then the pounds reappear in my life. They're drawn back to me like young adults back living with parents after they graduate. You ever feel that way? Now, some of you are just splendid. You never gain or regain a pound. But most people put their weight back on. And people that write diet books make a ton of money. Does anyone ever really change? Do addicts, are addicts able to stay away from addiction? You know how hard that is. You know the, the residual relapse is very high. What about broken relationships? Talk to people in Northern Ireland about healing along religious lines and socioeconomic lines. Sometimes things go deep. But I have to tell you, this is an extreme example of how people can change. My pastor growing up used to say, he was Scottish, he said, you can't argue with an experience. He said, you can't also argue, that's how you talk like that, with a changed life. I was once blind, but now I see. The Apostle Paul may have been, he was Saul before he became Paul, may have been one of the most anti-Christian people ever to walk this earth. He participated in the stoning of Stephen, one of the very first disciples, and he was absolutely committed to killing Christians. And he became the Apostle to the Gentiles. How's that? A real change. Let's stand for the Word of God. This is a bunch of verses, so hang in there. 10 through 24. Thank you. We didn't do 10 last week, and then we're going to delve into the heart of the matter this morning. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel was preached by me, that was preached by me, is not man's gospel. Underline that. You know what? I'm sorry. i got to go back to 10. My bad. For I am now seeking the approval for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. That's key. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who had called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, that's Peter, and remained with him for 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Wow. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Three principles. Isn't that new, huh? God's preparation. God's breakthrough. We're talking about breakthroughs in life beginning with 
salvation in Christ. God's purpose, your destiny. Real simple. God's preparation, all the things that He's already doing from the beginning of time to set you apart for this moment, the moment of breakthrough, which is followed by many breakthroughs after that, and then God's purpose, your destiny. Pretty simple, but yet enough to chew on for the rest of your life. God's preparation. I begin with verse 13, and then I'm going to go back to 11 and 12. Not to... Not to um, uh, confuse you, but just to show you the progression of the text. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father. But when He who had set me apart before I was born, who called me by His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son to me. I want you to just think about that. The Apostle Paul, Saul, was not a seeker. He was not interested in pursuing God. You can debate all day whether there is a genuine seeker. Seeker churches have to come to terms with that. The Apostle Paul was hostile to God. Now you say, well, most people I know in Denver aren't hostile like that. They're just not interested in delving into it too much. The Apostle Paul had a fire in his heart as a Pharisee. He was an incredible scholar. It's been said that had he not been converted, he would still be remembered as one of the great minds of history. He was an Old Testament scholar and he was a Pharisee. And I said, remember, for 400 years between the closing of the Old Testament canon and the coming of the Messiah, there was no direct prophecy, inspired word from God, but there was tons of religious tradition. And the Pharisees were good people, but they were absolutely committed to their understanding of building one tradition upon another. And they were so religious that the average person couldn't relate to them, like some church people today. But they had this incredible, zealous commitment to protecting the glory of God in the midst of the growing sense of Greco-Roman influence. So the Apostle Paul felt that Christians were so blasphemous that they had to be put to death. When you say that's a zealot? Now this sermon, this text has been preached many times with the title, The Terrorist That Became an Evangelist, or The Terrorist Who Became a Missionary. But he wasn't a terrorist in the typical sense of destroying innocent life today, just anti-life. But he was, so he would never have considered himself a terrorist in the Al-Qaeda sense. But he was absolutely committed to wiping out any shred of this blasphemous group called the Way that exalted Jesus as the Son of God and from their perspective distorted the glory of God in His holy. The Christians had to die. And so, Saul participated in the stoning of Stephen. And the Bible says that when Stephen died as a martyr, his face lit up with a glow of glory. He saw Christ. And you wonder back then how Saul of Tarsus would have understood that. But here's the thing. Paul is an extraordinary example a bigger example, you might even say an extreme example of what God does in all of our lives. You say, well, we're nothing like that. No, no, no. We're just bound by our idolatry and boredom and meism and all that stuff. We're not out killing people, but our hearts are no different. We really don't want God until what? He draws us to Himself. He appears and He disturbs. Now, I will say this with absolute conviction this morning. The reason you're here is that God is disturbing your life. Unless you experience His shaking, you can't know Him. Put it another way. Let's get even simpler. Most people in Denver are not interested in this. All right? It's not on their what? Radar. If you believe that, if it's right for you, that's great. If it helps you to go to church, that's great. But it's not on my radar. I'm not thinking. I'm not really delving. I'm not interested in religious arguments. I'm really agnostic or apathetic towards the deeper 
requested this. I've seen enough of church to last me my whole life. I know the hypocrisy of church. It's not on my radar. That's our city. But what God does, He begins to disturb us, shake us. Remember I said you can't know God unless you've experienced an outside power working with your life. And I distinguish that outside power between impersonal New Age stuff I said, it's the personal God, but it comes as someone just shaking your life up. Getting involved. You say, why am I even listening to this? What am I doing? And all of a sudden, I may have all these questions, but I'm being drawn to a relationship with God. And as Angela so beautifully taught us up here, you know, the whole sense of God is not dead. He's very much alive. Now, he's going to shake the entire universe, by the way. That's a bigger question there, a bigger issue. But he shakes our lives. C.S. Lewis said pain is God's megaphone. He literally interrupts the smooth flow of our lives and begins to draw us to himself. Now, the question you may ask is, why isn't he doing that to everybody in Denver? I don't know. God is sovereign. He's mysterious. He has his own ways of working. But hear this, please. The Lord works with hard stuff. Now, you say extreme example, Saul of Tarsus, yes. But the Lord God, and by the way, sometimes the more people protest against the Christian faith, the more they're really open and actually closer than you think. Give me an atheist who's hostile with me any day, any day, to a person who could care less and there goes my song. To a person who really could care less, all I want to do is go out and have a good time. If you believe that stuff, that's great. Give me a person who cares to ask the ultimate questions of life. Now, what's unusual about this text? It says that God, Paul says, Saul became Paul, I don't mean to confuse you here. Paul says, God set me apart from birth. Are you kidding me? How could that be? What happened all those years? Where did you go? What happened? What are you doing? He didn't just say God intervened on a certain point in my life. What seemed like a haphazard experience, He just intervened and I came to know Him. No, it said that God had set Him apart from the very beginning of time to be the Apostle for the Gentiles. Now, what does that mean? God is going to surprise you by the way, he draws people that you would never expect to a life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ. Don't put him in a box. He will finish what he starts. Now, I know the questions are already in your mind. What about so-and-so? Why can't they? I don't know that. I am not God. I think you knew that. I can't answer that. I'm a finite creature. I'm like an ant trying to understand the whole garden. There's just a sense I don't know those kind of mysteries. But I do know this, that you're here for a reason this morning. You got up out of bed for a reason. And there's a, there's a relationship wherever you're at that's beginning to work. It's your heart. And God is using your background to use you today in a great and mighty way. Let me give you an example. It's not so extreme. I grew up in a family. Um, well, how do I put it? I had a lot of struggles. My mom and my dad were not exemplary Christian people. I love them dearly and both came to Christ before they died. I miss them greatly. But we, I, grew up in a very tumultuous home. How's that for a correct way of putting it? It was a mess. And by the way, I couldn't talk about any of this when my mother was alive because she listened to each of my sermons for three times each. She had all these cassette tapes. Any of you were old enough to remember cassette tapes. And she had hundreds of them in the closet. She listened to her son's preaching over and over again. So I could never talk about my family. But I grew up in a home that we knew that when we entered these these church doors, that we had to put on a face, and we began to, like playwrights or people in a play, we began to act like religious people. But deep down, we were really hurting. So when I came to Christ, and my youth pastor had the gall to put me in a pulpit to preach, which I said I had never, I, I made a commitment, I will never stand up in front of people to talk. Because I, who would want to do that? And um, 
The, the funny thing was, God, I said, when I came to Christ and God called me to be a pastor, I said, I can't be a pastor. Because my family was too messed up. I'm going to tell you, from the beginning of time, God put me in that family. So that whenever I meet someone or a family that has real issues of pain and struggle, skepticism about church, God made me a pastor who was struggling with my family. you see that? And he said the same thing for you. Your background, your gifts. C.S. Lewis, if you read Keller's study on this, when he became an atheist, and of course the trend in Europe and in Britain in particular is moved towards atheism, this intellectual wind that has come over the whole continent of Europe, and now many of them are coming back to faith, Lewis said he never really left his faith. He just was angry at God for not existing. His words. But there, there, there's something about that. Lewis had a teacher who was an atheist. And if you had been one of his friends praying for him, he said, Lord, why are you allowing this? The big knock. Do you remember that? Any of you read the stuff? Okay. And for years, this was the formative person in C.S. Lewis's life. You say, Lord, why would you allow that? Why? Because after Lewis came storming back to faith, he became one of the great minds, intellects, lecturers, reasoners, relating to the intellectual culture of the world in a way that nobody could. God set him apart and allowed years of atheism so that Lewis could write mere Christianity and many other works. Do you see that? The same thing is true in your life. God is preparing you right now. And He's bringing disturbances. He's getting involved. He's actually talking back to you. Things are happening you can't explain. And He is shaking your life. So don't assume some people are off limits. I love Angela's heart for this movie. I didn't know anything about it. You know, our country's becoming more like Europe. And uh, I remember when we shared um, uh, with a bunch of neat young people in London when I was teaching there a year and a half ago. It was both a year and a year and a half ago. And um, they had an Alpha thing. It was like Alpha. Alpha is where you share your faith by inviting people over and you watch a film and you eat together and you have fun and you don't scare people to death. You just love them. And there was this young woman, and uh, we've kept in touch on Facebook some, and I'll never forget her reaction to the gospel. Um, and she was very respectful. And she said, you know, I don't know a single person that believes this stuff. She's talking about the young adult culture outside of London. She said, this is fascinating, the stuff you're telling me. But she says, I don't know one single person that actually believes this stuff. Okay, now, someday, I believe she'll come to faith. But it was such a... This is odd. Now, that's not America, but that's Europe. America is becoming more like that. And we have a chance to share our faith in an authentic way that stands out like a sore thumb and watch God work. God finishes what He starts. Or as my friend Steve Brown says, He gets you home before dark. Amen? That's a lot on the first principle. That's God's preparation. Second is God's breakthrough. Now, the big, the, big, the big breakthrough is, of course, the, the blinders of my eyes coming off. And then I say, yes, I believe that, Jesus, you are the Son of God, my Lord and my God. That's Thomas's breakthrough. But then following that, we experience, not, not all the time because of our stubbornness or whatever, one breakthrough after another. If it's in regard to sin... Some of it is just relational stuff. Some of it is just we're stuck in a rut. We can't get out. But there's a breakthrough that comes. Let me put it another way. The disturbance of God becomes an intervention. God says, you are mine. God says, you are mine. Now, I want to tell you that as America becomes more secular, and I'm committed to this city, it often becomes a slower process. A.N. Wilson was a Brit- is a British writer who uh, was a prolific writer and still is to some extent. And he became an atheist, like the British culture, after doing his interview with Billy Graham. 
and after writing a short biography on C.S. Lewis. How's that for a verse? And he said, he said, I had a road to Damascus experience with atheism. Isn't that funny? I, I literally, it was like opposite of the Apostle Paul. I realized this stuff is just not. But then a few years ago, in a leading British magazine, he, an article appeared, Why I Have Returned to Faith. And he said, unlike the Damascus conversion, for me it was very slow. It's been a very slow process, but I realized I am returning to the faith of my childhood. And it really stirred things up in England. I believe it's going to be true of many in Denver. Many people in this city do not buy this stuff one bit. You are kidding yourself if you think so. But God is at work in our city. He's going to be at work through you, through the musical expression of our band, through our lives lived together, through our love for people. There are people here that are so hardened to the possibility of faith. But step by step by step, God intervenes and then brings about a breakthrough. So don't ever think that God can't work. He's the only one that can raise the dead, by the way. And people in our culture will say, well, if that works for you, if it's helpful, isn't that great if that works for you? No, this is an objective and a subjective gospel. Did you read what Paul says here? Again, go back to verse 11 and 12. That gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. It's not just another religion. But I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. But I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. All right, let me put it another way. A relationship with God is not something you take up. People want spirituality, create your own God, whatever. A relationship with the living God is not something you take up. It's something that takes you up. Some of you are really surprised, if you're honest, that you're really here this morning. Some of you have been here a little longer. What am I doing? I wasn't really following this. It takes you up, and it becomes the passion of your heart. It's an objective gospel. The Apostle Paul said what? Who are you, Lord? And it was the Lord. Who are you? And that's the, the issue. It's not something we make up. It's not my gospel. It's crazy. It's an offense. It's a scandal. It's all of the above. But it is the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. But it's not just an objective thing. It's a subjective thing. And what Tim Keller says, if your life hasn't been changed by Christ, you may not know Him yet. Now those days are ahead of you. You may never have experienced Him. Now, it doesn't all look the same. It would be like A.N. Wilson. It may be a very slow thing. Or it may be like somebody who is just dramatically overtaken by God's glory. I was once blind, but now I see. But it is a subjective. He's not my Lord. That's what Thomas said. Remember what Thomas had said, though? Unless I see the evidence, the nail prints, the thrust in his side, what did Thomas say? I will not believe. And then when he saw, what did he say? It was worship. That's what it my Lord and my God. That's a breakthrough. God's breakthrough. Now, you, some of you have been praying for people for 20 years to come to Christ. And you may be saying, what's the you? You can't raise anyone from the dead. What's the use? We're talking about eternal salvation. And Jesus Christ being the objective revelation of God. Amen? So the breakthroughs will continue. I need some breakthroughs in 2014. I'm stuck in a rut in certain areas. I've, uh, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, but I need some major breakthroughs. My family needs breakthroughs, and I bet you do too. And so they will continue. But the biggest breakthrough is being able, like Thomas, to say, my Lord and my God. Okay, thirdly and finally, God's preparation, God's breakthrough, and now God's purpose my destiny look what he says in verse 16 I'll read 15 with it because of the flow but when he who had set me apart before I was born and who had called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles 
I did not immediately consult with anyone. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Now, this whole sequence is often overlooked in the study of Galatians. Wow, this is incredible how Saul of Tarsus became the Apostle Paul to the Gentiles and really became the architect for church planting around the world. Isn't that great? Before and after. Isn't it great how quickly God works? And I tell you to look at the text again. And it said, after this experience, and by the way, it follows up by saying, he didn't even go to Jerusalem where the first century churches were. And then Judea, as it began to spread to the Greeks, he stayed away and he went to the desert. And he was quiet. And he was still. And he was teachable. And he was being prepared. Billy Graham said years ago, and I've never forgotten it. He said, all across the world right now, in the most unlikely of places, God is preparing His heroes. And when they are needed, they will be called upon. But you don't see it. You don't hear it. It is the desert time alone with God. I hope you've seen that the incredible tension that's going on in the Ukraine between the nation's allegiance to Russia and Russia's strong hand historically and then the younger generation, particularly in western Ukraine's desire to have more of the freedoms of the European Union. And We've seen over 100 people killed this past week if you're concerned about what's happening in the world. And, and the Ukrainian church is very new, and uh, of course it was years of atheism and communism there but I ask you who is God preparing right now in that situation that will come forth and are coming forth all over the world God is preparing his heroes and when they are ready they will come forth but here's the thing I don't like about this text your growth your stretching comes in times alone with Jesus Christ now here's how you know for sure that Christ is real to you when you were alone with Jesus Christ in the desert, is He more real to you than any person in the world? Now be careful with that. Because I don't want you doing a lot of introspection here. But there's something about being one with Jesus and alone with Christ when there's nobody around. It's absolutely pivotal to our growth. Now why do I like this song the band did? And you did a great job thus, you know. I don't even know if it's that good of a song musically. You guys can weigh in on that. I just like the words. And um, I had a pastor a few years ago that left ministry for a time, and he I'm not sure what he's doing. He didn't leave his faith. He just wanted to do other stuff, felt called to do other stuff. And he, he was very successful. But he, he, he called those of us who are pastors together, and he said, this picture is going to show you the biggest challenge of your life. And you know what it was a picture of? A microphone. He says, he says, many of you in leadership are addicted to being before a microphone. And he said, that can be the most dangerous place in all the world. Because you are pontificating, you are thinking, wow, I'm smart, I'm cool, and, and just this sense of I've got to be in front of people. And musicians, by the way, can have the same thing. We're, we're up in front. We're composing. We're writing. We're just that. We're just drawn to being. Look at us. And he says, real growth takes place away from the microphone through the struggles of the desert. Now I, I'm in a dangerous spot because I've been pastoring for 33 years. And I don't know why the Lord allows me to continue because I know the wretchedness at times of my own. And I know many pastors that go on the bench, we call it. And not just not for big moral stuff. That's, that's another thing. Not just that. Just something happened and they wind up seven years out of the ministry. It's like... And, they, and it's just, But God, God is not so interested in what I do before you. Yes, this is important because I'm giving you the truth. But what is this song saying? I sing it over and over again. But all my deeds and my good name are just dirty rags of tear and stain. 
cover all my guilty stains that you've already washed away. And here's my part I love to tell God. All you ever really wanted, all you ever wanted was my heart. You want to love me. I'm intent on performing all you've ever wanted is my heart. That's what God's in us. You say, but I want a designer of life. Everybody. I want to make a difference. Yeah, He will. You're prepared for good works before the beginning of time, so don't sweat that. But don't realize if you look at the Apostle Paul, and he was blind, by the way. You can read that in Acts 9, and the Lord literally took his physical sight away. And then the, the prayers for healing and seeing again. Jesus ministered for how many years? Anybody remember? Can't be in the back. If you're first service, you can't answer. What? Huh? About three. Okay. How many years does that mean in preparation? How old was Jesus when he was crucified? Thirty what? Thirty-three. So how many years of preparation? Think about that. Why didn't he do it at 21? He could have had a really cool young adult church. Huh? 21? That's, that's much more. You get 30, it's old. Because God was preparing. We don't have any information in Scripture what he was doing. We have when as a child in the temple. I'll tell you this. He, and it says what gives us a hint. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. As we do, but it's in the desert. So be careful that you don't rule out the slow growth because you see, you are called as an oak of righteousness. And if you've ever seen a great oak tree, some of the trees in California, by the way, were really, those are the redwoods I saw, but the oaks go deeper, don't they? And the reason they go deeper is the soil has to be settled and unraveled And the turbulence of the roots has to go deeper so that they grow deep and they also grow very high and they last for hundreds of years. The Bible presents our destiny as an oak in righteousness. But you say, wait a minute, I seem like I'm struggling with the same stuff for a year and a half. A year and a half? How long does it take an oak to grow? Only a year and a half you're struggling? God is taking you. And He's disturbing the soil of your life through struggle and disappointment so that you will grow deeper and deeper and deeper. We had a great sermon illustration come out of the first service. And I'm not an expert on diamonds. Anybody here an expert on diamonds? He says a diamond really is made up of carbon or carbonite way beneath the earth's surface. And it's really not that beautiful of a piece of jewelry. Or stone, excuse me. She says, what happens though is that the incredible pressures of the earth force the carbon, the carbonite, up, up, up until this incredible pressure forms a sparkling jewel that has been brought about through intense struggle. And then she said, that diamond easily chips and has to be polished and taken care of so that it can shine with luster and beauty. But it, a diamond wouldn't be a diamond unless there was intense pressure. I said, why don't you preach at this church? Wow! So you can bring in a sermon illustration next week. But isn't that an incredible picture? So it is. Time... Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, Thank you, prison, for having been my life. Ooh, I don't want to go to a gulag. Because it was in prison that I learned that the arrow between human good between good and evil goes right through the human heart. Now, one thing and we're done. I want you to see this. And by the way, I encourage you to read it, read it again, read it again, and ask God to show you his glory. It says here, they're only for hearing it said, the churches in Judea. He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Now, I didn't ask for a show of hands, and I'm not going to either there. 
because most of us are really, we're pretty aware of how mundane our lives are, aren't we? If I were to ask you, how many of you have had people glorify God because of your life? You say, well, that's just not language we're accustomed to. I, I mean, I don't think I'm, ugh. And I wouldn't say to you, why not? Because if you say that's not about you, maybe, maybe you don't understand who you are. Here's the question. Is there something supernatural about your life right now that can only be explained by the presence of the risen Christ? And in so, and there is, if you know it. And in so, people say, I thank God that in you I can see the glory of God in Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. The band. And maybe you, maybe that song will stick in your heart all you've ever wanted, Lord. Because it's it's the quest of His heart for your heart. I'm just going to wait for just a second while they get set up, just so we can have a few moments of stillness in the presence of. Lord Christ, we are in awe of you. The very fact that we would be able, like Thomas, to confess you as my Lord and my God. And we thank you that you use hard situations, hard people. You allow hard seasons to achieve your purposes in us. And so we thank you, Father, for the preparation taking place in our lives even before we were born. And we thank you for the disturbance of the Holy Spirit pushing us to a relationship with God. Creating havoc in our lives. We thank you for the breakthrough of the Gospel. The objective reality of the risen Christ. The subjective experience of knowing Him. And if this morning if you're sensing the Holy Spirit pulling not my words at this point. And as you heard the Apostle Paul say, it's not man's gospel. It's not somebody teaching you about some way to become a Christian. It's the Lord God appearing through His Word and the power of the Spirit. Pray this prayer with me, Lord Jesus Christ. You've come for me. Give me life. And to fill my heart with glory. And to take away the root of my sin and the horror of my sin. Thank you that you did it in such a painful way on the cross. And that from you as I receive Christ, I receive the completed righteousness of Christ, the beauty of Christ. In you. you prayed their prayer, you've entered the kingdom of God, and you've become a follower of Jesus Christ. If you're not sure, thanks for being here as Jed said earlier. Father, for those of us who name the name of Christ, once again, we look back. In the fast food culture, we say, it's got to happen now. And you say to us, let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. Because you're going to be around for a long time. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his name. Amen and amen. Could you please stand for our final song?